This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Seasons, greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and aggressively cute plaything. Like a lot of things Disney wants to pretend they invented, the idea of children's toys having a life of their own goes back a long way. From the Nutcracker to Pinocchio to the Velveteen Rabbit, authors have imagined what kind of desires might fill a plaything's heart. To become truly alive, to love and be loved, and sometimes to go on a killing spree. But even the creepiest of Toy Stories can't hold a candle to our next offender, Raggedy Ann and Andy, a musical adventure. This 1977 cult cartoon has some pretty astonishing pedigree. The title characters are voiced by Dee Dee Kahn and Mark Baker, the songs come from Sesame Street tunesmith Joe Raposo, and the director was animation legend Richard Williams. Yes, the thief and the cobbler Richard Williams. And since we've already discussed that saga in this court, it should come as no surprise that this production was similarly troubled. The movie was originally conceived as a live-action Hallmark television special, Dick Van Dyke was on the shortlist to play Raggedy Andy, but it was decided actors playing dolls was rather silly and was placed in the hands of Abe Levitov, a prominent member of Chuck Jones' team at Warner Brothers, who promptly died shortly afterwards, putting the project in William's lap who, being Richard Williams, rejected the producer's initial idea of minimalist UPA-style animation in favor of a detailed storybook feel, requiring two full animation units, one in New York and one in California. This early attempt at remote work was difficult to pull off pre-internet, especially as Williams had to fly cross-country multiple times to keep tabs on everyone. The budget inevitably skyrocketed, and what was meant for a Christmas 1976 release didn't see the light of day until March the following year, when it promptly flopped. It hasn't been officially released since the VHS days, but YouTube is a wonderful thing when it comes to oddities such as this, so let's examine the case of Raggedy Ann and Andy. The movie begins in live action as a little girl named Marcella comes home from school with her much-loved Raggedy Ann doll in tow. Come on, get cleaned up for your party. Okay, Mom, come in. Marcella is played by Richard Williams' daughter, which is a cute cameo, although it does explain her line readings. With Marcella gone, the toys come to life in animation, and Anne gets some touch-up stitches done from her rough day. Despite Marcella being a bit hard on her, Anne is the envy of all the other toys as she gets to experience the world outside their playroom. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Yeah, I think I know why none of the other toys are let out of here. I suppose I should expect this sort of thing because it's Richard Williams and it's the 1970s, but most of the toys in Marcella's room resemble a turn-of-the-century nightmare carnival. No wonder she spends so little time there. Anne explains that today is Marcella's seventh birthday, which is perplexing to the other toys as they don't understand the concept of aging. But rather than grapple with that existential dilemma, the old grandpa doll tells them about presents, pointing out one has been left in the playroom. Only then do the other toys notice the large package in the room, and that it's pulling at Dorothy's house on Anne's brother, Raggedy Andy. I spent the whole day under that thing. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the fucking box? Anne, being the only doll in the room who's literate, checks out the label and discovers the present was sent from Marcella's Aunt Sophie in Paris, while Andy remains distinctly unimpressed. Contents. One French doll. Just what we need around here. Another darn doll. And already I don't like Andy. He has this belligerent tough guy attitude that would already be a turnoff, and the fact it's coming from a dopey looking rag doll makes it even more insufferable. He even gets a whole number about how he doesn't want to be thought of as a girly girl's toy, and it's really hard to make your case for your own machismo when you're singing a Joe Raposo vaudeville number. You're just crazy! I'm no girl's toy! Maybe lazy! Watch it, sister. After that little bit of Richard Williams' show-off, Gramps announces that Marcella's on her way up, and we shift back into live action to see her opening her present. Guess they didn't have the budget for party guests. 
Inside is a fancy porcelain doll of the kind that will last about 10 minutes with your average seven-year-old, who Marcella dubs Babette and places in her dollhouse before going downstairs for cake so we can get back to the animation and the toys can greet the new arrival. Babette? Hey, Babette! <laughs> okay, I laughed. I'm a demon of simple tastes sometimes. Babette is not too thrilled at being surrounded by creepy dolls, though honestly with those eyes she shouldn't be throwing stones, and sings a little aria about how much she misses her native France. Always she dreams of the life by the sand. I do not think she will see Paris again. Anne is sympathetic to Babette's homesickness, while Andy is a bit of a jerk about it, but unbeknownst to both of them, the pirate who lives in the snow globe on Marcella's shelf, his name is apparently Captain Contagious, but he's never called that during the movie, spies the new arrival and immediately gets G-rated horny for her. A miracle! All I think has come to me! Sure is a picture. Eh, I think she's kind of a pill. Look, movie, I get it. You've got Joe Raposo, composer of Sing and Be and Green, a man whose work exudes nostalgia and childlike wonder and warm fuzzies. You want to use him as much as possible. But if you have to interrupt a song to keep the plot moving, that may be a sign that you need to kill one or two of your darlings. Sin number three is kind of a rare one for a musical in that there is too much music. There's no set ratio for how much of a musical should be singing. It can range anywhere from a few songs to literally everyone sings all the time. But no matter how much of it you have, it should serve the overall feel and arc of the story. Raggedy Anna and Andy tends to get bogged down by its songs, which show up in the most random places. Raggedy Ann, oh Raggedy Ann, hey what you thinking about? Case in point. And that's a shame because Raposo provides some real gems for this movie, like Anne's I Am song, Rag Dolly. But with so much other music going on around them, it makes it harder for them to stand out, and they feel more like they're stalling the movie rather than enhancing it. The captain uses his prehensile mustache to send an SOS signal to Anne, who takes him at his word and decides they must free him from his watery prison. Fortunately, old man doll Maxie, not the other old man doll, this one has a toolbox in his hat and arms like a Hindu idol, has a glass cutter on hand. Look, it was the 1970s. Everyone was still cool with kids fiddling around with things like pocket knives and jarts and radioactive materials. Predictably, things go south almost immediately as the playroom gets flooded, the captain's parrot Queasy turns off the lamp, and Babette is kidnapped under the cover of slightly less light. <laughs> As the ship sails, well, waddles, off, Anne regrets having imperiled Babette and vows to rescue her, even if it means venturing into the deep, deep woods, which are deep and deep and woodsy. Andy comes with because his name is in the title too, and the siblings drop themselves out the window and into the unknown. Are you scared? Well, you shouldn't be which is less spooky than it is murky. For all of William's perfectionism, you'd think he'd have this scene looking less like a day-for-night filter in a cheap live-action film. Regardless, the dolls find the whole thing to be suitably creepy and dispel their fears, how else, by singing another song. Rhymes and songs we sing for our words Words to say I love you true which turns out to be sin number five in spite of it being a genuinely good standalone piece because the sentiments edge way too close to the romantic for characters who are supposed to be brother and sister. Unless Marcella's last name is Lannister. Also, this is one of those cases where the vocalists are good individually but do not sound well in counterpoint. If the night is hearts and paper flowers and I'd like to hide after that bit of borderline twincest, a strange sound startles the Raggedies, but it turns out to be their officially designated traveling companion. It's a camel! All beat up, too. Oh, I know, I know. The 
This is the camel with the wrinkled knees, and he has the pretty standard tragic toy backstory of being dearly loved by a child before being parted from them, in this case by being thrown out by the mom for being too beat up. He's been wandering ever since, chasing after a hallucinatory caravan of sky camels that make me think he got into some of Dumbo's booze. On the plus side, he does have one of the better songs in the movie. How can you be happy? How can you be smiling? How can you be anything but low down saggy and blue? Anne and Andy take pity on the camel and climb on his back, even though it's pretty obvious he's already got a monkey there. Sure enough, the moment they're astride his humps, he starts careening towards his own personal mirage and not watching where he's going, sending them right over the edge of a Chuck Jones cliff. You don't know where you're heading! I don't care! They land in a giant pit of taffy. The Deep Deep Woods has one of those, apparently, which is home to, and or the body of, a creature called the Greedy, who is basically an exercise in technically impressive but weird-ass animation. Despite constantly eating, the Greedy is never fully satisfied, and of course he has a song all about that. But without a sweet heart, I never get enough. No, that's my said. Anne makes the mistake of mentioning she has a candy heart sewn inside her. Fun bit of trivia, the first Raggedy Ann dolls really were made that way. Which the Greedy believes to be the sweetheart he desires. He attempts to devour the trio, but they make their way out of that random and weird sequence and into the next random and weird sequence. Stick him up. Uh, what? Bang! <laughs> Who is that message for? The characters? The writers? The audience? This is Sir Leonard Looney, who explains that they are now in Looney Land, where all the world's practical jokes come from. Anne and company quickly realize this guy will not be very helpful and try to get away, only to wind up in a castle that looks like it was built from repurposed Thief and the Cobbler animation. Which brings us to sin number six, and one which seems to be a recurring issue for Williams, the inability to back up brilliant technical artistry with a strong story. Several sequences in Raggedy Ann and Andy, the encounter with the Greedy among others, were left in not because they serve a narrative function, but because they represent a lot of hard work from the animators. And while it's certainly admirable to want to show their efforts, it creates a movie where things kind of just happen at random. It's pretty common for the traditional hero's journey to involve encounters with strange obstacles and perplexing characters, but it usually serves some purpose. Dorothy and her friends need to discover their own strengths, while Alice confronts absurdities that echo those in her Victorian world. None of our protagonists feel challenged or changed by what happens to them. They just endure it and move on to the next scene. Eventually, the trio wind up in the throne room of the ruler of Looney Land, King Cuckoo. He's diminutive even when compared to the children's toys, and that makes him cranky because his subjects are always laughing at him. Well, they laugh at everything, but he takes it personally. The only way King Cuckoo can grow is by laughing at the expense of others, and he wants Anne, Andy, and the camel to hang around so they can be the butt of his jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, there's a real lump in my royal pudding. You see, only a part of me gets bigger. Just a part. Ooh, I am really glad this movie isn't rated R. Andy starts a pie fight and the heroes flee in the ensuing chaos, making their escape in the world's creepiest flying machine. But the king isn't done with them yet and sends an underfilled beanbag named Gazook after them. Say, I couldn't give me the laugh that will make me bigger than anybody ever was! Ever! <laughs> really? What's that? Celeste laugh! The creepy mobile is seaworthy, and soon the dolls are within sight of the pirate ship. Because, remember, this whole thing started as an attempt to rescue Babette. But it turns out Babette is in no need of rescue, as she's managed to take over the ship and is setting course for France. The captain is now chained up with Queasy in the hold, to whom he bemoans his fate. Just as I had my prize in my grasp, 
just as I was about to pluck the flower of paradise. Dude, kids movie. But apart from that, it turns out that there has been an actual story going on this whole time and we've missed it. Somehow, Babette tricked or seduced the captain and turned the tables on him to accomplish her goal of escaping Marcella's playroom and returning to the place she considers home, and the captain is now repenting his evil bride-stealing ways, there was motivation and character development, and we didn't get to see any of it because we were stuck with the random pointless crap happening to the other characters. Anne, Andy, and the camel launch themselves onto the pirate ship, where Babette makes it clear she has no intention of returning to Marcella's room, even though Anne is super polite about it. Anne's super polite about everything, it's like her one character trait. Where's the captain? I am the captain now. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. Babette ties up her would-be rescuers and sets course for Paris, unaware that King Cuckoo and Gazook are hot on their tails. Fortunately, Queasy has discovered his beak can double as a lockpick and he frees the captain, who frees the others in turn just as Gazook boards the ship and subjects everyone to tickle torture. You see, Babette? Marcella told us never to leave the playroom. Wait. That's the lesson you want Babette to learn? Never leave the house ever? That's a pretty crummy message, and we could have had a better one if we had more of Babette's perspective. Babette is, in some ways, a spiritual predecessor to Buzz Lightyear, a toy who considers the lot of a mere plaything to be beneath them and comes to learn that the simple joy of being loved and cherished by a child can be every bit as fulfilling as the more glamorous existence they had envisioned for themselves. Babette's arc could have made for a good movie, but instead we got something like what would have happened if Woody had just wandered around aimlessly by himself for an hour before stumbling on Buzz in Mrs. Nesbitt drag. The King's schadenfreude causes him to grow to massive proportions, but Queasy, who, let's face it, is the closest thing this movie has to an actual hero, figures out that like all bullies, he's full of hot air and goes to puncture his ego in more ways than one. And somehow this causes everyone to wind up in Marcella's backyard, maybe because it was all a dream or some secret toy dimension or however you want to justify it. Marcella finds all her dolls and takes them back inside, but the poor camel is left alone and hallucinating under some leaves. Wait for me! Wait for me! Don't go away! Babette apologizes for the trouble she's caused, Anne is all no big deal, and also Babette and the captain are dating now because something something I cannot stress how much I wish this movie had followed them instead. Anne sings about how happy she is to be home, and finally they notice the camel peering sadly into the window and bring him inside, making their creepy little nightmare family complete. We'll always keep me close. Anne and Andy has a lot going for it, in spite of, or maybe even because of, some nightmarish characters and scenes, the animation is very good, especially the floppy ragdoll quality of the title character's movements. Joe Raposo is in fine form, with several songs that will give you the same cozy, comfortable feeling of his best Sesame Street contributions. But it never comes together as a cohesive whole, and can feel like too much of a good thing. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell condemns the producers to eat an entire plate of too rich Christmas fudge by themselves. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>